So let's talk a bit about artificial intelligence and behavior trees. So what's a behavior tree? Well, if you think about computer science and you think about the kinds of computing that we can do, it's a way to define behavior for your opponents in the game. And we use a tree for a variety of reasons, but a big part of it is that it was designed to give you some flexibility. So if you look at the history of, of the way that people have defined artificial intelligence in games, you know, first they were creating finite state machines. And the finite state machine is something that we do even if you look at your animator, for example, your animator has these states and you go from state to state and it changes what animation you're on. Well, that's in essence a finite state machine. It turns out, if you look at a bit of computer science theory, that a finite state machine is about the weakest uh, sort of computing device you can create. Uh, it's not powerful enough to you know, exhibit any kind of behavior. But of course, you know, when we have defined finite state machines in games, we've often added abilities at nodes that have given it the full functionality of a programming language. Well, it turns out that behavior trees are a similar uh, idea. And with a behavior tree, you want to have a tree that represents a kind of behavior as to what's going to happen. And I rec really recommend like, you know, just Googling around and looking around for information on behavior trees. <clears throat> I'm going to just create one here for us to see, you know, how this would work in Unity and how we would build one. So the best way to understand it is really just to get started. And we're going to create some classes that are outside of mono behavior in order to do this. And so I'm going to just create uh, a script and I'm going to call it behavior tree node. Now it's created it as a mono behavior by default. And I want to get rid of that because I don't really need it to be a mono behavior per se. I don't need all of the machinery that comes along with that. I want it to be a simple representation, sort of the base class of all of my um, behavior tree nodes. So uh, we've created this and it should pop up here shortly. And so I'm just going to say does not inherit from anything. And since it doesn't inherit from anything, it doesn't have these methods. And instead it's going to have a um, enum, so a public enum result. And the kinds of results are going to be running failure or success. So this creates an enumeration and it has three possible values, running, failure, or success. The reason is that the behavior tree is going to execute nodes and the nodes themselves are going to return a result every time it executes. And so the result is going to be running, failure, or success. Generally, if it's running, it's going to continue to execute that node until it gets either failure or success. So that third state, that running state, allows the tree to know which you know node is running and which one you know and how long to continue uh, executing that node. So similar to like you know we, what we've done with coroutines, our behavior trees are going to let us you know distribute this behavior and this logic over multiple frames because we can run particular nodes to calculate certain things. Now to make our life easy, we're going to create a few helper properties. So we'll say public um, behavior tree tree, and we'll just give it a generic get and set. And you know, behavior tree isn't defined yet, but we'll define it shortly. And then we will say BT nodes. So we're going to create the constructor and this constructor is going to take a behavior tree as an argument. And then in it, we will say tree equals T. And, um, oh, I should call this T here. So uh, all we're going to do is assign it here. So let's go ahead and create this other behavior tree object. So again, we'll say create and we'll say C sharp script. And this time it's okay that it's um, inheriting from behavior, uh, from mono behavior. So we'll call this behavior tree and um, then we'll get this set up here and so we can see that it inherits from mono behavior and that now this immediately fixes you know the issues that I was having here in my node over here and uh, we should be set at this point oh I forgot a semicolon here which is why it's not <laughs> normally you have to define what the actual function is this is a shortcut to say just create a backing variable for that property for me all right so Let's look at this behavior tree. What is, what is this going to have? Well, first of all, it's going to have a root. And so we should make this probably private. And we will 
um, actually have to declare the type, which is BT node. All right, and so we're gonna have to construct this and then we will say something like private bool started behavior. And this will be a variable that's gonna let us know if the behavior has already been executed, all right? Um, on top of this, we, you know, we want to make sure we have our collections here because we're going to use um, some methods in order to set up things for our behavior tree. So one of the things that you have to have is some concept of memory. And this memory is going to be, uh, we often call the blackboard. Now this, the, <laughs> the blackboard is an old name from artificial intelligence uh, research. And, um, and, and the idea is that it's a memory space. So it's a space where you can write things to and you can read things from. And you'll see that most behavior trees have some concept of this idea. Um, but for us, it doesn't really matter because we can just, you know, use a dictionary for these. So we can say, you know, public dictionary and we can say string object. And this will allow us to store anything that we want to store in here. And from this, we can say get set. So this is again gonna be a property, and this property is gonna be a dictionary, and it's gonna have a key value pair. So any string I can put in there, and then it's gonna return any object that I want. We also want access to the root of the behavior tree at any point, so if we wanna grab the root, we can. So this is gonna be a BT node type, and it's gonna be root, and we're gonna create a getter for it. So get, and we'll say return m root. And we're not going to provide a setter for it. This will make it a read-only property by not giving it a setter. And, and it's nice because then when we construct it, we can make sure that it's created with the root, you know, initially. Now, um, in the start method is where we'll set up our initialization for our behavior tree. And so the first thing we need to do, of course, is to create our blackboard. So we can say blackboard equals new dictionary of that type. That's fine. And let's add blackboard. We're going to add a key to it and we're going to add world bounds to it. And what we're going to add to it is a new rect 0055. All right, so this now lets us, um, if we were to query the key world bounds, it would give us this rectangle object back for us to, you know, do behavior tree kinds of things on it. We're also going to set the started behavior to false. Okay, so we'll say started behavior. That means it hasn't started yet. And we're gonna set the root to be what we want it to be, okay? Now, what we're doing here is we're gonna construct our behavior tree manually. And so I can't really do anything at this point. I'm just gonna leave this empty for a second. You know, the behavior tree by default, it should have something set up for how you want it to be created. And most game engines would give you the ability to create behavior trees um, through the game engine itself. So for example, if you look at like Unreal, you'll see that they have behavior trees built in with a special editor, because these are the sorts of things that you really wanna do visually and trying to construct these purely with code is not a pretty thing. What we're gonna do anyways, uh, but so, so you can create these and you can imagine creating a script that reads a configuration of a behavior tree from a file, and then eventually you could build your own editor for it if you'd like. Um, but this gives you, you know, the working machinery for the behavior tree, you know, in the background. So let's go ahead and, and uh, set up our update so we can actually understand what a behavior tree is gonna do. And it's gonna basically do something like this. So first it's gonna make sure that started behavior is true, or if it's not started behavior, then we're gonna start it. And then we'll say start coroutine run behavior, right? So we're setting up a coroutine here. And it might make sense actually, you know, to have a private um, coroutine uh, variable um, called something like behavior. And then we'd store it here so that we can then access it at a later time and stop it if we needed to. And so now we'll say started behavior equals true. So we'll know that this is started. Now, obviously we haven't defined run behavior yet. So let's go ahead and define run, run behavior. Well, you know, um, as we've seen before with coroutines, it's gonna be an I enumerator type that's gonna be returned. And we'll 
call run behavior, that we'll call the function run behavior. And then simply what we're gonna do is say bt node dot result, not reference equals, uh, result, result equals root dot execute. All right, and then we will say um, while result equals bt node result running. So in essence, you know, as long as it's running, we want to continue to execute this. So we can log this if we'd like. Uh, so we'd say like root result plus result. And then we can say yield return null. And then finally, result equals root execute. Now there's no execute function as you see, and that's because our BT node doesn't actually have an execute function on it. And so of course we need to add that. So let's go back to our BT node here. And with our BT node, we will just simply create a public virtual function called execute. Uh, it's gonna return a result type. All right. And then by default, we're gonna return result failure. And the reason we do that is because we need to inherit from BT node. And so we wanna make sure you have overridden execute in order to be able to do something. Otherwise we're just gonna return like it's not gonna work for you. So that's why we return failure by default. And any val valuable uh, you know, um, behavior tree node is gonna do more interesting things in its execute function. Okay, so now if we go back to our behavior tree, we will see that we're done here. So we can say, um, you know, debug log behavior has finished with plus result. Okay, so this should give us the value that we get when we're done with our behavior. Basically, as long as it's not running, success or failure is what we should get here when this is done. I mean, this allows us now at this point to create something very simple and say m root equals um, new bt node, just like this. And this would allow us to create it, but of course we have to pass in our behavior tree here. So we'll just say this. And then this gives us this object that's going to be passed into it so that we can access it from the other nodes. So, you know, this is just very basic in terms of what's going to be created, you know, for the system. Um, and so we can come over here. Let's go ahead and create an empty object. And to this object, we're going to attach my behavior tree. And what we should see when we execute is that this node's going to be run and we see behavior has finished with failure. Okay. That's exactly what we expected, so that's great. So um, let's go ahead and do some more interesting things. Now, you know, behavior trees, the whole point is to define the different kinds of nodes that can be executed on the behavior tree. And so we have two kinds of nodes really when we deal with a behavior tree. And these nodes are decorators, okay? So the nodes that are decorators um, are the ones that are gonna you know, possibly alter the results that come back from the behavior tree or do something uh, to affect the subtree. And then the composite nodes and the composite nodes are gonna have a list of children because those composite nodes are going to um, execute things possibly sequentially or, or provide different functionality for us. So let's look at creating these and we're gonna create a new, a few more classes. We can just do this in Visual Studio. So we'll say, uh, I'm you know using my uh, folder, subfolder here, behavior trees, and I'm gonna create a new class. And the new class is gonna be called um, decorator, decorator. And it's not gonna inherit from anything. And I will use the same name here in the constructor. And then I need to rename this. Whoops, I did not wanna delete it. So I need to rename this to decorator. So that it has the same name because uh, Unity really wants that to be the case. And then now we have this decorator class that's gonna be our, um, our the decorator type, the base class for all of that. And so from we really need to inherit from BT node here. 
And um, this will now tell us that we need to, of course, use a behavior tree here. And we'll just say that. And then that means that we need to pass this to our um, base class. So we'll say base T. So now we're calling the right constructor in our BT node. And then what we really have is just one child. Um, so we can just say BT node child get set. All right, so remember the decorator affects like one sub branch. And so that sub branch is gonna always start with just a single node. So it's gonna be on top of a single node and, and it'll affect everything that happens underneath it. And so here we can just say child equals C. Um, and so we'll need to pass in another argument here, which is BT node child or C, C for child. I uh, forgot my semicolon here again. All right, so this is just a base decorator class. Again, we inherit from BT node. We have a single property. This property is the is called child, and that's going to return whatever child was set when we constructed the decorator. So we'll need to, when we construct the decorator, pass in whatever child it's expecting to be constructed with. So let's do the same thing that we just did, but we're going to create a new class, and this is going to be called um, decorate, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> composite. Let's say BT composite. All right, and of course this is gonna have to inherit from BT node. And then we'll do a similar thing. We'll just say public list BT node. So we're gonna make a property, children. And we'll say get set. This will construct it automatically for us, or, or give it, create the getter and setter for us automatically. Um, we're going to have to say using um, system collections generic, and then that will make sure that works. Uh, we will want to rename this to BT composite, and then we'll have to call this. BT composite, and then of course it's gonna have to take a behavior tree. And in addition, we want to pass in a an array of nodes that are gonna be the children. So we'll pass in, uh, oops, I forgot to name my variable T here. And then we will use this and say children is going to be equal to new list BT node, and then we will um, give it this value here, the nodes, in order to create it. So that's going to construct a new list out of that array that we're going to pass in, and then this will let us use some easy syntax to create stuff. So this is what a composite node looks like, right? So whatever it's going to do, you know, again, we're going to have an execute function. Remember that execute is virtual and it lives on BT node. So my decorator and composite both have an execute function. We just don't see it um, because you know it's part of the base class. So further children will have to do something with these um, execute functions in order to make them actually interesting. Like right now, nothing interesting can happen. So we need to still build a few more classes to get this working nicely. So let's do the same thing that we just did, but we're gonna create a new class and this is going to be called um, decorate, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> composite. Let's say BT composite. All right, and of course this is gonna have to inherit from BT node. And then we'll do a similar thing. We'll just say public list BT node. So we're gonna make a property, children. And we'll say get set. This will construct it automatically for us or, or give it, create the getter and setter for us automatically. Um, we're going to have to say using um, system collections generic, and then that will make sure that works. Uh, we will want to rename this to BT composite, and then we'll have to call this BT composite, and then of course it's going to have to take a behavior tree. 
And in addition, we want to pass in a, an array of nodes that are going to be the children. So we'll pass in, uh, oops, I forgot to name my variable T here. And then we will use this and say children is going to be equal to new list BT node. And then we will um, give it this value here, the nodes in order to create it. So that's going to construct a new list out of that array that we're going to pass in. And then this will let us use some easy syntax to create stuff. So this is what a composite node looks like, right? So whatever it's going to do, you know, again, we're going to have an execute function. Remember that execute is virtual and it lives on BT node. So my decorator and composite both have an execute function. We just don't see it um, because you know it's part of the base class. So further children will have to do something with these um, execute functions in order to make them actually interesting. Like right now, nothing interesting can happen. So we need to still build a few more classes to get this working nicely. So let's go ahead and extend the composite node um, because they give us some of the ability to um, do certain kinds of things with multiple children. Uh, in particular, from composite nodes, we usually get a kind of sequencer, a kind of selector, and a kind of parallel node. And we'll go through and see what each of these means. So we'll start by creating a new class. And this class is going to be called BT Sequencer. And from this, we will say using system collections generic again. And this class is going to inherit, of course, from a composite this time. So this will be BT sequencer. And we're going to inherit from BT composite. So we'll get all the same things that the parent class has. And so we got to use the same name here to fix it. And then, of course, um, in order to create the um, sequencer, we need to make sure that uh, we have the right constructor. And so the constructor is going to look something like this behavior tree T and then BT node children. And then we're just going to call base T children just like that. And then that's enough to create the constructor for us. We don't have to do anything else specifically in here. Um, and then what we really need to do though, which is the most important part is to keep track of the current node we're executing on and then execute the next one. So we will start by creating a private int and this will be current node. It's going to initialize to zero when we create it so that then when we override, okay, our execute function, There we go. Then we can um, change our behavior, right? So we can say if current node is less than children.count, then we can say result, result equals children current node execute. So you can see what we're doing, right? We have this um, this this list of children, and we're keeping track of our current node, and we're going to call execute on it, and it's going to give us the result. And you can imagine from our parent, what's going to happen is our parent's going to be calling execute over and over again on this node. And so at some point, our result is going to return something different. And so we can say, if result equals result running, so in other words, if it's still running, then we're going to return result running. So if our child isn't done executing, then we're not done executing. So we'll just return that. Otherwise, if result is equal to result failure, then we'll say current node equals zero. So we're going to reset our current node and we'll return, return result failure. And then finally, we will say current node 
plus plus. So in other words, we're going to increment our current node and we'll say if current node is less than children count, then what we want to do is say return result running. Okay. So in other words, if we haven't exceeded the number of children we have, we're going to just say we're still running. And the next time we get called, since our current node is incremented, it will call us to execute the next child in the sequence. Otherwise, we're going to say current node equals zero and return result success. So let's take a second to really think about what all of this means. And let me just double check here to make sure I've got what I needed. Um, the final thing to say after all of this is really return result success. And that'll get rid of our squiggly line because they're, you know all code paths didn't return a value and they needed to. And so by default, we're just going to say, you know, if we have no more children to run, we're going to just, you know, say that it was a success. So what is this sequence really doing? Well, if you think about it, the sequence is asking the question, did all of my children return success? And if all of my children returned success, then I was successful. But if any of them returned failure, any single one of them, then I returned failure. And so really you can think of this as a, an and situation. So it's sort of like an and gate. And it just basically says that all of, you know, I must have true for all of the children. And if not, then I will return false if any of my children return false. Now, of course, they're executed in the order that you declare them. So it's going to be a sequence. Uh, these things are going to happen one after the other. But then it's going to get, re you know, return true or false or, or failure or success based on what my children do. And in the meantime, while I'm still calculating, I just return running. So I never, I don't exit early. I have to make sure that my children are completely done. And I can't really tell if they're completely done until I get to this branch here, right? So this branch is what's telling me that, you know, I've, I've passed my, um, my current, or I should say this branch, actually, <laughs> I've exceeded my count. And so I need to either return success or, or not at that point. Okay. Now let's just take a look at this code to make sure that we think it's correct because we want to make sure that everything makes sense here, right? So if the current, if it's still running, then we're going to return that it's running. And if we've exceeded that count, then we would have returned success. Now, is it possible that it should have returned, that we should return failure here? And the answer is no, because the only way we got here was if this was running, not running, and this was not failure. So the current node that was executing couldn't have given me failure and then I can't increment to get to the next step. So that's sort of the logic you have to go through in your head to make sure that these things are working the way that you're expecting them to work. So the natural question then is how do you create a selector? Now a selector is similar to the sequencer but returns success if any of its children return success. And it processes the children in order. So think about the difference here in what your logic would need to be. You'd need to execute it and if it's running you would return running. And if it returns failure, instead of returning failure, you would just go to the next child. So in other words, we'd have kind of a swap of logic between a selector and a um, sequencer. And then if it returns, if, um, if returns success, then you would return success. So in essence, you only can return success, right? Or you return success if any of the children return success at any point. And you only return failure only if all of your children have failed. So what does that mean? Well, it's similar to an OR gate in this case. So think about the OR logical operator. In order to get false, you have to have everything return false. If any single thing returns true, you return true. And that's what happens here. If any child, when it's executed in order, returns success, then you return success. And so you can imagine how you would build a selector in that case. And really the last node that you would have that's a composite node is the parallel node. And the idea with the parallel node is to simulate sort of a simultaneous behavior. And um, you would do this by just, you would still execute them sequentially, but you would execute each child one at a time. And then you would only return um, if a node returns success or a failure. So in other words, those things are going to be returning running, but as soon as any of them are returning success or failure, then you're going to uh, return at that point. 
So, you know, there are different ways to implement parallel, and these are different, these are done differently in different game engines. So you should just make sure you take a look and understand what it means to be running something in parallel, and um, then you can figure out how to set up your logic for it. So now that we have um, some uh, composite types, let's go ahead and create a new class, and this is gonna be a decorator. And there's different kinds of decorators. Um, so we're gonna create a repeater. And what a repeater does is just continually repeat what's happening at the child level. All right, so we will call this BT repeater. And then we'll have to do the same thing here, BT repeater. And this is going to inherit from decorator. I should, probably should have called it BT decorator, I know. And this will be BT repeater here. And of course it's gonna have to take a behavior tree, T and a um, BT node as the child which we'll call C, and then we will call this, we'll say base TC here. And then that will call the correct constructor of the decorator class. So that sets it up uh, properly with the construction. And so what do we want to do in our uh, execute function? So we're going to override it, execute. Uh, we have to actually have the right return type, which is a result. And we're gonna simply, uh, we can just log it if we want. So debug log. Uh, I'm sorry, this says return. This should be result. I was like looking at my squiggly arrows and I'm like, what is going on? So debug log, child returned. So we'll see what the child's return result was. And we'll say child.execute. So we're gonna execute the child. Um, <laughs> we're not gonna, <laughs> We're not going to execute that. We're going to run execute on the child. And then we will say return result running. Uh, so you can see how like, you know, what's going on here is that we are um, setting this up so that the return is going to always return running. In other words, our repeater is going to always repeat. There will never be a case when it doesn't repeat. So we have a couple of errors here. And one is that, uh, this child uh, looks like it doesn't have the right access. So let's go to the decorator and I didn't put an access on there. Normally that means like package access if you don't put anything on there, but we're gonna make it public because you'd probably wanna access the child from the decorator. And then also if we go back to the repeater, we'll see that debug log doesn't work. This is because we're not importing the namespace for a Unity engine. And so you want that if you wanna actually be able to log from your repeater. So now that we have a basic set of, you know, um, sequences and we could create selectors if we wanted to, and we have a composite and a decorator, we can create a leaf node that will give us the behavior that we're trying to build with our behavior tree. And so we're going to build a leaf that is based off of the BT node. And this leaf is going to be, is going to choose a random location to walk to. And once it gets there, it's going to return success. So we do that by inheriting from BT node. So we'll go ahead and we'll create a new class. And this new class, we are going to, let's rename it. And we will call it BT random walk. And then we'll have to do the same thing here, of course. And again, this will inherit from BT node. And so we'll have to inherit, we'll have to have BT random walk as our, um, the name of our constructor. And this of course, we'll have to take a behavior tree. And because we are a leaf, we don't really take any other arguments. So we need to make sure that we call the base class with this T. And so this gives us, you know, the basis for constructing our um, random walk node. So now that we have the constructor set up, we can set up the rest of the class. And so let's make a protected vector three next destination property. And this will have a getter and a setter, just default. So it's gonna be a simple vector three. And we'll also want a public float speed because we wanna make sure that we can set the speed for how fast we move. 
And then, you know, we want to set up our constructor. So our constructor, um, you know, it's already set up the base tree, but we want to set our next destination by default to just be vector three, zero. And we also want to say find next destination. Now, at this point, there's no function called find next destination. So we want to define that ourselves. We're going to have our find next destination return a bool destination. And in here, we are going to set up uh, first initially an object because we're going to need to pull something out of our dictionary and we're going to write to this object. Then we're going to want to, you know, make sure that we found something. So bool found equals false. And at the very end, we know that we're going to want to say return found. So whatever happens in between here and here, we need to know if we found what we were looking for. So the way we do this is we can just say found equals tree blackboard, try get value. And here's where we have that key. So world bounds. And we're going to copy this into the object O. Now we can test if that was actually found. So in other words, if we found that key in our uh, dictionary, and if we did, then we're going to typecast the bounds uh, to be a rectangle. So rectangle object from Unity. Oops, that's a zero, not an O. All right, uh, then we want to grab random value. Oops, it's not going to find this. C Sharp has its own system random, but we really want Unity engine random value times bounds width. And then we want float y equals Unity engine random value times bounds height. Now there's one slight problem with that, and that's that, you know, if the center of my camera, like is in the center, then my world bounds are gonna be off. In other words, this is always gonna give me a value that's between zero and the width. And that might not be exactly what I want, but I'm not gonna worry about it too much. You know, you can just write a little bit of extra code. Basically, you'd subtract out half of the width from whatever value it gave you, and that would give you a negative to a positive. So in the bounds, you'd want to check to see, you know, where the, the actual bounds of it, instead of just looking at the height and the width, because it's just calculating by doing a subtraction, <clears throat> you know, the rightmost side and the from the top and the bottom uh, from each other. So the right from the left uh, to get you this width and the height. So now that we have this, we can say next destination equals new vector three X, Y, and I'm going to put zero here uh, again. This is a three dimensional value, but we're dealing with a two dimensional game. And so you don't want your Z value to be something weird. I mean, in worst case scenario, you could say next destination dot Z just to make sure that whatever it was set to initially, you have the right plane. Um, but otherwise I would just set it to zero and not worry about it. And then after that found should be fine. And so then the next destination should work. So it should return true if it was found false, if it wasn't, and if it was found, it's going to set the next destination vector this property to be a random value from zero to the width and zero to the height. So now we want to set up the override function. And so we'll say public override result execute. And we want to just replace this. And what we want to say is, you know, if we've arrived at the point, then find the next destination. And we're doing this because, you know, we're going to move our object to its destination point. And then once we're done, we're going to return success or failure. If we're going to return failure, if we can't find the next destination, but we should pretty much always be able to. So we'll just say if tree game object transform position. Okay. If this is equal to next destination. Then in this case, we want to try to set up our next destination. So if find, so if not find next destination, then we want to say return result failure. Else we're going to return result success. 
in essence, if we couldn't get a next destination, we can no longer execute, so we'll return failure. But you do have to remember, you know, why you've set up things the way you do with your behavior trees. So returning failure here may not kind of make sense because we did get to our final, you know, point. But maybe there was some reason we couldn't get to the next destination. And so, you know, we would have returned failure somewhere else. But, uh, uh, you know, in any case, let's go ahead and set up the rest of the code here. So we'll say else. And so this is the case where we are not at the next position. I mean, at the next destination, so we need to move towards it. So we'll say tree game object transform position equals vector three. Oops. Move towards. And so move towards takes two arguments. The first one is your current position. The second one is your um, uh, target. Uh, and then the third one actually takes three arguments is the max distance. So um, we'll use tree game object transform position again. And then we'll use um, next destination as the next place to move. And then finally, we'll use time delta time times the speed to figure out how far to move this frame. That should be sufficient. And so we can then say return result running. And so in essence, this you know tree branch could be executed over and over again as long as it hasn't gotten to the destination. And then once it has, it's going to hit this branch. And then if it can find a new de destination, it'll return failure. I mean, su uh, success. If it can't find it, it'll return failure. And so this, you know, node will execute over and over until it gets to its, you know, that next uh, waypoint in essence. Not really a waypoint, but a random, you know, randomly chosen point. So given all that, let's see this in action. I'm going to go ahead and take my main camera and I'm going to set its size. Okay, its size is already five. That's good. And I have a game object in here. And to this game object, I'm going to add a sprite renderer. And I'm going to go ahead and attach an object to it. And we'll just attach one of these planets. And um, let's see, make sure that it's in the right Z location. We'll go ahead and put it in the center of the screen at first. And it has this behavior tree set on it. And so at this point, we should be able to run things. And it should randomly um, execute the tree to pick this up. Now, um, OK, I said that, but I realized, I just remembered, I have not set up the actual constructor of the behavior tree. So we're not quite done yet. So let's go back to our original behavior tree that has just an empty node. And we'll see how we can set this up to uh, do the correct thing by uh, executing a random walk over and over with the behavior tree. So instead of just creating this empty node, we'll say new BT, BT repeater. Okay, so this will be the repeater. This is gonna take two um, arguments. So uh, this, because we're the behavior tree, and then we'll say new BT sequencer, which will take this, and the sequence we're going to give it is a new BT node, and it's going to be new BT random walk. And so this is syntax to um, uh, create an array, as, but we can do it all text. So I'm basically telling what type it, of array it is, and then I can give it the elements of that array inside the uh, bracer, braces. And you know, if I could, I could put other objects in there, but I'm just going to put one in there just to, but I'm putting a sequencer so you can see that there's a sequence. Um, and then it's going to do the random walk and make sure we got everything matched here. This looks correct. So basically it, the, the root is now a repeater. So it's going to do this over and over again. It has a sequence in it. And in that sequence is a random walk node. I could put multiple random walks and it would do one after the other, but it doesn't really make sense here. Um, you know, unless I changed something about the world bounds in between here. Um, and I would need to do add another node that would cause that to happen. So right now the world bounds are going to be 0055. And so it should random walk in, you know, the space of the camera. So let's take a look. So we have our game object here. It's got the behavior tree attached to it. And now it's going to uh, randomly pick a location from zero to five. And we can see that uh, I'm going to collapse my nodes here, but we can see that 
Every time it gets to a point, it returns that uh, the, the child is successful. So that's from the repeater node. And then it's just picking a new you know destination to run to constantly. And um, yeah, this is how you get behavior trees. So you know, there's a lot of more things that you can do in terms of the, the nodes. The only real leaf I made was the random walk leaf. And, you know, you could imagine making a leaf that is, say, you know, detect the player. And if you detected the player, then you would go to the next step in the sequence. So you would return, you know, running while you're trying to detect the player. And then once you actually detect the player, you return success. And if you return success, then you would go to the next sequence in an element, uh, the next element in a sequence, I mean, and then you could start chasing the player. Or if you don't find the player, instead of returning run, you could return false or, or failure. And then instead you could just, um, you know, do a patrol. So you can see how you can, you know, sort of create these more complex behaviors. Um, and then parallel nodes, you know, are useful when you want to do multiple things at the time. So maybe you want to chase the player, but maybe you also want to fire at the player. And so you have a separate leaf node based off BT node that determines like which direction I'm going to aim in and when I'm going to fire and how fast I'm going to fire and, and various things like that. So um, all of these sort of work in conjunction and really the sky's the limit in terms of what you build. Um, but it is it does take some thought and especially trying to put these together, you know, directly in code. Is challenging, so I would highly suggest if you develop this further, you know, that you would create some kind of editor for it. And so that's, you know, a basis of how you create behavior trees in Unity.